pedophilia if he says no to it, even though it's actually the, the very opposite. Like he's he's in favor of you know of actually doing the right thing against these things. And the other thing was uh, the way it's the way it's it's been it's been labeled. It's if you every everyone would have to support it because it's like you know the job creation bill or the the something you know the American Invents bill. It's all very. It's something that, that that you would naturally assume is going to pass, and and, and the, I don't really know who chooses these names. But the, 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 uh, honestly, it? if I had to guess, I'd say whoever's putting it forward's political advisor for the reasons you're talking about. They're like, well, this is going to be something that people aren't going to want to vote for, so we're going to name it like this, and we're going to stand before the public and say it does this because nine out of ten people won't read it, yeah. so they'll hate whoever stands against. The bad things this does because yeah. they're against the good thing that it doesn't do. <coughs> yeah, of course. It, usually, it's very, very uh, beneficial to corporations, which means that the politician who supports it is likely to get some funding or likely to get some campaign uh, contributions. And one of the things that I thought about um, a moment ago is the way they—I don't know—the way they label these things. It's, it's, it should be monitored by some by someone. I mean, they they could give a nice name to a bill. His main proposal is to basically not tax the super rich people. You know, if you're a rich person, you'll be taxed more. But if you're above a certain level, you're untouchable, and you don't, you don't have to pay tax. That's that's the truth now in the states. And I'm not sure how. The, uh, that's actually not a truth in the states, but okay. <laughs> if oh. you listen to our political rhetoric as of late, you, you would think that. But uh, well, rhetoric usually is basically we have to make the super rich really, really comfortable and cushy and stuff because they create all the jobs, and if we give them tax, that, that, they, they that, 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 that's that's Republican rhetoric and Democratic rhetoric is they don't pay their fair share. Uh, the reality is the when they talk about the the rich. In the United States of America, um, they're paying on average fifty to sixty percent of our tax base, um, and more under certain tax codes. Even though in some cases they're being taxed at a lower rate, uh, and I, I mean I'm all for tax re tax reform, but it, it's there's a it, there are new scapegoats. Over here in this country, and I'm well, like, well, I've just read statistics. Uh, the Forbes list, I think it's Forbes, uh, the top 400 people in the states, the richest top four. You're supposed to value people by their money, based on the newspaper, the corporate press. So you're supposed to think that the top 400 people are the richest people, and they're worth together almost two trillion dollars. Yeah, um, about one point seven statistics. trillion. Yeah. And you know, they're they're not doing too badly financially. You know, the economy might be going down, but they gained, I think, twelve percent in the past year. And many of them pretend to have all these foundations and charities and you know, they pose with, you know, black children and you know, if you say anything against their so called charities that give them tax exemptions. Uh, actually I know the article you're you're quoting that was recently made their internet. Their actual wealth gain was around uh, a few percent. Uh, it, it wasn't actually that much. Yeah. But at what, what's creating the real destitute is the same thing that happens anytime you have an economic recession. The more wealth you have, the more savings you have, the better setup you are to weather the storm. And the reality is, if you're below a certain number, the you know, if I have a billion dollars and I lose 250k. I still have almost a billion dollars. If I have 300k and I lose 250 thousand dollars, I'm wiped out, <laughs> and it's just a reality. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the I'm not sure to what extent it's true that the uh, that there is a certain blackmail that I hear about from both corporations and people. Well, they basically say, well, if you don't lower the taxes, I'll move to somewhere else, and then the, the politicians are just like you know running around and. You know, doing tricks and stuff, and and trying to please the uh, these people, even though the threats themselves are just just really blackmail, and they aren't actually going to. Act that, that, that is a valid argument when it comes to that, and that is corporations can be based anywhere they want to be. You know, they could leave the U.S. and go be based somewhere else, and then only be taxed on their U.S. business instead of the whole other business. Um, and that has to do with the reality of we're in a global economy. I'm sure this is just as much uh, this can happen in Europe. Just as much as it can in the U.S., uh, we're in a global economy, and the reality is, if somebody wants to relocate from blah to blah, um, I'm thinking over the coming decade or score, the governments of the world 
by virtue of the fact that they cannot afford this anymore, are going to do the same thing many of the states have started doing in the United States, and the EU did uh, when it's on. In the U.S., we have sales tax, and many of our states, not all, but many of them have what they call reciprocal sales tax agreements. If I'm in state X, but I sell goods to somebody in state Y, I'm required to charge state Y sales tax, and I pay my comptroller, but my comptroller has a reciprocal agreement, so that state gets their cut of the sales tax for that sale. Um, and the EU has done that in some ways with the EU alliance. By virtue of the fact that everybody's broke right now, I think other countries are going to realize for income and other taxes, they need to, you know, come to the bargaining table and work out reciprocal tax agreements. So when company picks up and moves to coast, yada yada, they still are subject to reciprocal tax agreements, so they don't get to run away from their tax obligation. Yeah. And it's mutually beneficial to both countries. Did you uh, watch the stock markets today? Did you have a <laughs> chance? I mean, the FTSE is down about five percent. I think the Dow Jones was down three percent when I looked at, I don't know, an hour and a half ago. Um, and and it had me thinking. I was talking to a friend of, of mine in the car, and uh, one of the things we were talking about is I was trying to explain to him the situation with the patent system, the whole patent reform that they they call it. And the fact that we still very much rely on imposing our system of patent system and so-called intellectual property rights or whatever uh, on other countries for them to pay us a tax and everything that we buy uh, from them that they manufacture. So if, if we have no manufacturing here, the only way to try and extract money from it is to have some way to to persuade them to pay us. So we make all those myths about you know research and development and you know how we gave them the knowledge. Even though most of the knowledge is actually common, you know, common knowledge and commons, uh, the fact is now they try to establish what's called a global patent system, and there is something I've just recently learned about. It's called a tri trilateral patent office. Uh, I think it combines the Japanese patent office, the European patent office, and the U.S. patent office. Yeah, uh, and that's that. I wasn't aware that they already had these things in place, and I think they do actually want to try and move towards a global patent system, and I, I've done, I've worked my way through around 100 cables from WikiLeaks. The, uh, the, the, the hard part on that is going to be getting China to sign on to that. Yeah, so Japan has been working on it, so I actually found cables that show a communication between these countries, and I've seen that Japan is doing quite a bit of work in China, trying to get China to get all excited about patents and try to get their own patent system and get very much enthused about all this R&D thing. Uh, and then it will be easier to bring them into the into the fold and to merge with the West and accept the same rules, uh, which aren't of any any interest whatsoever to the Chinese population. It's actually working against them. And if you if you actually read articles about what's going on in places like Foxconn, I mean, I, I read some I, I read some details today, and, and and it's about I think 11 hours of work a day, working like 20 hours, no sorry, 20 20 days in a row, and then taking like a break, or maybe it's like 50 maybe it's 15 days in a row, and the way they have barbed wires around them, and they have the nets, of course, because they because of the suicidal tendencies among the people who work there, and the sleeping condition and everything else. I mean, everything we have here, and loads of the things we have here in terms of objects we buy and consumerism, is very much coming at the expense of loads and loads of people being born and being used since they're very young people uh, to work in places like these factories in China. And, of course, it's not exactly a prison because they could choose to be out of there. But what do they do then? You know, they'll be out of work and they'll be really in a, a position. So we still are in a system where I think globalization is very loaded term, obviously. From the point of view of patents and the, you're talking about patent reform, uh, what we have here in Europe is, and 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 throughout the time that the uh, U.S. patent reform was being debated, the European Patent Office had the nerve to start talking about how it's all wonderful and how it should do the same. And what you find increasingly is most of more of them move into the same uh, the same legislation that they go into a kind of a unified or harmonized uh, law. And in Europe, they also try to move into a central court, which means that you can sue a company uh, in Europe and sue in, you know sue the instead of suing in loads of courts in different countries, you can do it in one court, central court, and then completely destroy the boundaries. Which then, if you combine it with NAFTA and all the treaties that they now do between Korea and the states and these countries. It's basically leading towards a very global patent system, 
uh, instead of having to... Um, Which, depending on the shape of it, could either be the best thing ever or the most destructive thing ever. Well, if you look at who, who benefits from the patent system, well, let's, let's say it's usually multinationals and their lawyers, and then you have the parasites, which are the patent trolls, uh, mm -hmm. which are just a, really a side effect or a symptom of the problem, but not, not 